Tatsmewi, Oikalo, Katia El, Hanua, Katia El, Oikalo. It is so good to see you all this morning on our day five of the um, virtual conference honoring missing and murdered Indigenous people. Um, as we have been every day since we started, I would like to acknowledge that our conference is being broadcast from the unceded ancestral lands of the Burns Paiute tribes of Oregon, the Confederated tribes of Warm Springs, also in Oregon, the Fort McDermott Paiute and Shoshone tribes, and the Shoshone Paiute and Shoshone Bannock tribes of Idaho. <clears throat> we have been using a link in the chat to help you all explore um, on whose native land you are, if you do not already know. We think that is a part of asserting sovereignty for indigenous communities. And we also see it as an opportunity for you to uh, engage with the indigenous folks, whether you are in Idaho or uh, in a different area. So thank you for utilizing that resource and for sharing with us where you are located from uh, during our broadcast and during the conference. Um, our event is sponsored by the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. Um, it is also co-sponsored by the Idaho Council on Domestic Violence and Victim Assistance. Uh, we also have received some funding from the United States Department of Justice. Um, and we have some local sponsors, the Indigenous Idaho Alliance. The Pride Foundation has also contributed uh, a bit as well. So we're happy to have them as partners. Um, today is a day that we start to explore a little bit more academically about the issue of violence in Native American communities. Uh, we, we had a bit of an exploration of that uh, when we had Sarah Deer joining us, but today is, I think, uh, an important framework for the way that we approach prevention and response when it comes to MMIP, mitigating violence, and then prevention and response for violence in general. Uh, I had mentioned uh, yesterday, if not the day before, that sexual assault and domestic violence are so closely interrelated. And then it also is part of a tapestry of uh, oppression and racism, the dehumanization and marginalization of indigenous communities in the United States. So having a clear understanding and accurate understanding of what happened historically to our people over the course of 400 years uh, is important to understand where we're headed in the future. How do we dismantle something? How do we um, create innovative solutions if we don't have a clear understanding of the past? Indigenous communities often hold generational knowledge. Uh, I, when I call myself the storyteller, um, I, I also assert that the stories that I carry are not my own. They have been passed from generation to generation. And what's happening to me in my lifetime and the story that I'm writing right now in my lifetime is for my descendants. So nothing belongs to us. We carry that intergenerational arc um, across communities, across nations, across tribes. And I think that understanding that the knowledge that we carry to solve this issue is also cultural knowledge and deep-seated tribal knowledge uh, to the tune of 15,000 years for some of our nations. And as Purse Tribe is geographically dated to our ancestral homelands to about 15, between 15,000 and 16,000 years ago, um, just because it's not written academically in a book just because our knowledge is not peer reviewed in some obscure journal um, out of some academic institution doesn't mean that it is not science. It doesn't mean that it is not an anthropology. It doesn't mean that it's not geography or geology or ecology. So understanding that academia is as equally as important as our cultural knowledge, I think is, a, is an excellent lens that Sheena brings to our, um, to our conference. I um, have met Sheena last year. Uh, was it last year? Yeah, it was last year. Wow, it was already a year ago. Um, as a part of our collaborative work between the Idaho Council and the Idaho Coalition, at the time, I believe Sheena was doing research um, with one of our area tribes. And at the time, I was building some relationships for um, violence mitigation with those same tribes. So our paths had crossed. And, and here we are, fast forward to today. Um, 
Uh, Sheena comes to us from the Stockbridge Muncie, did I say that right? The Stockbridge Muncie Nation, and is now a graduate assistant at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. Uh, I heard that they call themselves Omaha, so we're putting the inflection in the wrong syllable when we talk about that nation. Um, some of you may not know that Omaha is actually a nation of people. Um, unfortunately eradicated, I believe, or near eradicated during westward expansion. So there's a tidbit of knowledge for you. Uh, Sheena, if you wanted to take away, we're happy to give you the floor. All right, thank you so much, Ty. Um, it's an honor to be here to present to you guys today about, you know, like she said, two very important topics, um, topics um, historical context, and how we can go ahead and shift that narrative. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get right to it. And just a really quick housekeeping question while we while we get your screen up and I can see your screen just to verify that for you. Um, I can't remember, were we taking your questions as we go or would you like us to to hold those for the end? Um, you can hold those for the end okay. and I will, uh, there will be a break too because you know i understand that a lot of this stuff is you know very heavy very um you know definitely very trauma filled so i want to take a break after i get through the really heavy stuff to let everyone you know recoup and get centered so we can then start the second half excellent thank you sure. all right so um like i said today we're going to talk about you know why is historical context important and how do we shift the narrative about victimization? So first, um, a little bit about me. As Ty mentioned, I am a citizen of the Stockbridge Muncie tribe in Wisconsin. Um, this is a tribe that is located about 45 minutes north of Green Bay, Wisconsin, very small. Um, I recently graduated from Boise State University with a master's in criminal justice. And as Ty mentioned, I had uh, conducted a thesis that looked at intimate partner violence in a Native American community. Right now, I'm a first year doctoral student at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. Um, while here, I was awarded a gender-based violence in Native American communities fellowship. This fellowship is funded by the National Institute of Justice in collaboration with the University of Nebraska, Omaha, and the Nebraska State Patrol. So with this fellowship, we are looking into the missing and murdered indigenous people, uh, just like they're doing here in Idaho. And because I am a researcher, I do have research interests, and in those are victimization, uh, Native American crime and victimization, Underserved victimization, these are underserved populations such as children, inmates, um, elderly, um, homeless, disabled, and those that live in like rural locations. Um, I also examine college campus and university sexual victimization and policy reform. Specifically with the policy reform, I'm learning more about the Violence Against Women Act and how that impacts Native communities, specifically women. Um, also, I did not grow up on a reservation. I actually grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood, uh, small town in Wisconsin. Growing up, I knew I was Native, but um, only because my mom had, you know, mentioned, you know, that I was Native, but I had never identified a Native. I always identified as white. It wasn't until I was 21 when I actually started working for the Oneida tribe, and there I was immersed in the culture, you know, five days a week. I worked for their health center, um, and it wasn't until then that I really began to understand what it was like or what it's meant to be Native, and um, at first I was very angry that I had actually grown up white, and I didn't have any um, touch with my Native roots, but since then, I now identify as Native. I'm very proud to identify as Native, 
And, you know, I'm also an Indigenous survivor. So Native victimization is very personal and very important to me. And it's my passion to use my PhD to further educate um, others and inform them about Native victimization and other issues that are happening in Native communities. So a little brief overview of what we're going to cover today. We're gonna to cover a lot. Um, I'm also gonna be presenting from an Indigenous researcher's perspective. So um, I'm gonna do my best to describe some of these topics in like a way that's easy to understand. So first we're gonna go over Native American victimization rates. I know this has been talked about probably throughout everyone's presentation this past uh, week and also last week. Then we're gonna talk about historical context, why it's important, uh, why something that has happened many, many years ago is still relevant here in 2020. Uh, we're gonna talk about intergenerational trauma. This is how trauma is passed down from generation to generation and why it still exists today. Um, another form is called the cycle of violence. This one is going to mainly deal with the children cycle of violence and how something that happens in childhood is passed down and uh, still exists with them as adults. Um, and because the cycle of violence deals with children, uh, then I'll talk about some child abuse stats and what happens if a child witnesses abuse. Again, this was covered a lot in Lenny Hayes' presentation last Tuesday when he talked about sexual victimization of men and boys. Um, then we're gonna talk about how we change that stigma of victimization and how we can go about reducing um, the risk of victimization. Um, and then in regards to domestic violence, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, we're gonna talk about who is most likely the offender or the perpetrator of these crimes. And then we'll talk about tools for a narrative shift. And then we'll end with how we can continue to build bridges with others, mainly criminal justice agencies and researchers. All right, so for those of you who don't know, and for many of you that probably do know, Native Americans have the highest victimization rate compared to any other race or ethnicity. As you can see here on the chart, granted this is from 2009, um, but as um, we know, and even a, from the researcher standpoint, we know that natives are still have the highest rates. So here you can see, you know, per 1,000 women, natives are victimized, you know, at 7.2 women per 1,000. The next closest is African American at four. So there's very large gap in between native women who are victimized and then other race and ethnicities. So in 2016, Andre Rose examined the 2010 National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. This is a national ongoing survey. They conduct data every year and I believe they analyze it every five. I know this report was discussed in last week's presentation by Sarah Deer and uh, Lenny Hayes, but um, I believe it's the first and it's the largest um, examination of native victimization. And I believe it's the only one that actually includes um, data for men uh, being victims of some type of uh, sexual violence. So overall, he found that 84.3% of Native women and 81.6% of Native men had experienced some sort of sexual violence in their lifetime. Um, and then when he looked at women specifically, he found that 56.1% had experienced sexual violence, 55.5% had experienced physical intimate partner violence, 48.8% had experienced stalking, and 66.4% had experienced psychological intimate partner violence. And then when he examined the data for men, he found that 27.5% had experienced sexual violence, 43.2% had experienced physical 
um, intimate partner violence. 18.6% had experienced stalking and 73% had experienced some sort of psychological intimate partner violence. Sadly, there's just not enough research out there, especially in regards to men and being victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, intimate partner violence. Um, for a researcher standpoint, most of the research that is out there is regarding Native women, but just in general, there's just a lack of research out there about Native victimization. You know, again, there's reasons for this. Uh, you know, there's reluctance from communities wanting to participate in any kind of research. And this has to go back to, you know, in the past, how we were um, shown in like a negative light that we are such savages, that we were like less than human. Well, if you're depicted that way, why would you want to participate in any kind of future research? So from my standpoint, it, you know, it's sad that there is such a lack, but then um, also I understand that there's reasons and it's important for people to understand too why there is um, a lack of research out there about Native. But hopefully after my presentation today, um, more communities would be willing to participate because there are people out there, you know, researchers that do care and they do want to help. Um, so, you know, despite the hesitation, you know, there, there are people that want to help. All right, so then we move into historical context. You know, why is historical context so important? Well, in general, it just gives a better understanding to why natives are victimized at such high rates. It can give context to this and give a clearer picture. And for mostly, like, we know about historical context, you know, natives, like, we understand, we know. But this is more for those who are not Native, those who aren't aware, don't understand why historical is important when it comes to wanting to learn and examine uh, Native victimization rates. Um, it also can give a better understanding of why there is so much distrust when it comes to the federal government. And in like my aspect, you know, studying criminal justice, why Native communities just don't want to trust uh, criminal justice agencies or the federal government. So this horse historical context can um, give a better understanding of that, you know, and also it was perceived that we had so much violence and so much victimization because it was our fault that we allowed it to happen, that we let it come into our communities, but the historical context can shed light on why, you know, why there's so much violence, why this is happening, that it's not our fault. You know, this is something that is relating to something that happened to our people. And, and um, with the historical context and the history of our violence, this traces back to colonization. You know, um, it colonization, it's created this social setting that promotes this violence um, against the natives. It devalues our people, devalues our culture, our traditions. You know, the, uh, through colonization, the power was taken away from the native people um, when they were forced to assimilate to the patriarchal roles and the ways of the Western culture. And, you know, removing, relocating, and assimilating of our people, it's just broken down these tradition and cultures. And it's also broken down our support systems. When the children are removed and put in boarding schools or were relocated to reservations and forced to assimilate, it breaks down these very important support systems, whether it be the support system in our family or even within our community, like um, everything is being split apart. And breaking down these traditions, cultures, and support system, it, you know, it made some communities having to be dependent 
on someone and that ended up being the federal government. But unfortunately, the federal government, the ways of the Western culture, it was just not compatible with the indigenous way of living. You know, the Western Clark, uh, excuse me, culture is patriarchal. Native communities are matriarchal. So there's, you know, some clashing when you're trying to have patriarchal roles and then matriarchal roles. And with the patriarchy, it forced a lot of change in the traditional roles, not just for uh, women, but also for men. Um, with patriarchy, uh, men are considered the ones that are in control. They have more power. They, you know, are just perceived to like have this more prestige. We're in a matriarchal society like ours, you know, there's more egalitarianism, but also women just have, you know, are held a little bit to a higher standard. They might have a little bit more power than it is in a patriarchal society. So when those patriarchal roles are forced on Native communities, it now gives men more power and control over women, and then um, thus it disempowers us women. Uh, we no longer have that, that status, that perception of being matriarchs. Um, and then when Native women aren't allowed to fulfill their traditional roles um, within the community, it actually has made us more vulnerable and more marginalized and even segregated us sometimes from communities because uh, we don't know what to do. You know, we aren't able to fulfill our matriarchal roles. Um, and an example of devaluing women, while I was reading some research, I came across this federal appellate court ruling in 1968 in which a statute was upheld that said if a Native American man was convicted of rape on a reservation and the, he would receive a less harsh punishment if the victim was also Native. So you can see how the ways of the Western world just you know, held women to a lesser standard that if a Native woman was raped, oh, it's not really a big deal. Um, you would receive a lesser harsh punishment than if like a white woman had been raped. Um, colonization has also brought stereotypes to our community. You know, they, we were referred to as savages. We're less than human. We don't um, deserve to have this respect and um, protection from this outside violence. So it just penetrated our communities by you know, these stereotypes, um, you know, prior to colonization, it was believed that um, things like rape and domestic violence didn't really exist to the magnitude that it does, you know, today or, um, ha or how it has throughout generations. And that had a lot to do with like the elders in the community and the families who would help mediate these conflicts and protect the victims. Uh, you know, this was talked about in uh, Sarah Deer's presentation, how Native communities are victim-centered. If, um, a, you know, a, there was a victim of rape, um, she talked about, you know, what she say, it be law. It was the choice of the victim, whether it be male or female, that, well, in this case, it was female, that it was their decision what was to happen. But in the Western culture, it was you know, even today, it's a third party. It's the criminal justice system that makes that decision. So the ways of the Western world are just not compatible um, with the ways of, you know, our tribal communities. Um, interesting, another uh, research article I had read had a, interviewed nine Native men and wanted to get their perceptions and their thoughts about it commit partner violence and domestic violence. And they had said that they believe that it was a disease of the outside people um, and that it was a result of colonization. So historical context, colonization happened hundreds of years ago. How is this still relevant present day 2020? Well, one concept is historical oppression. And this is a prolonged universal and intergenerational 
oppression that is experienced um, by a population, that being Native communities. And when this oppression is such long periods of time, it's then integrated and adopted into the lives of those who are being oppressed, you know, that being Native communities. So this historical oppression, um, you know, just continues to be passed down generation to generation because if we're continuously oppressed, we end up adopting, you know, and believing it. And then that it just manifests and continues as we, you know, pass down generation to generation. Another is historical trauma. Um, and this is a progressive, immense and chronic trauma that is imposed on a group of individuals across generations. And those individuals, of course, would be natives. Um, you know, and it's said to be found throughout native communities and it affects people within communities uh, back then and even today. You know, it causes um, high amounts of suffering and sadness and this suffering and sadness can be seen today. Um, and this trauma is created by someone who is not part of the community. It comes from an outsider, somebody that wants to do harm and do damage. So this isn't something that this trauma doesn't exist within the community. It comes into the community and it creates all this um, havoc, this sadness, uh, this suffering that just continues from generation to generation. So it's said that with historical trauma and present day trauma, they're actually thought to intersect. And it's because of these past traumas that leads to current traumas that this serves as a context in which natives live their lives. It's just so trauma filled. Um, there's just so much sadness. And for those who are outside, it's hard to understand how something that has happened to our ancestors, why, you know, why do we still feel it today? And it's just because it's within us. It just, it's when you're surrounded by something like that, it just, it becomes your whole life. And it's just something hard to get away from. And it, when it exists in the community, it's even harder to get away from because you just see it everywhere around you. Um, you know, in this continuous oppression that's faced by Native communities, you know, you, like I said, you start to internalize these and um, these degrading attitudes about ourselves. And then this is even more inflicted when you have somebody that's in power that has experienced this oppression, then they begin to um, pass that on to other generations they continue this oppression onto others and they because it's all that they knew it's all that they had learned and they just keep passing it down um, and then that's how that cycle just keeps continuing so we're gonna um so intergenerational trauma so now that we talked about historical context you get like a little bit better understanding of you know why it is so important for something that happened so long ago, why it's so relevant today, it all comes down to this intergenerational trauma, this trauma that just keeps getting passed down. Um, so when it comes to intergenerational, there's actually two aspects. The first one is called epigenetics. And this stuff is like, it's beyond me. This is like biology. I don't really quite understand it, but I just found this very interesting to look at it from this aspect. So, um, and for those of you, and even myself, you know, what is epigenetics? It's the study of what's called a heritable phenotype. This is something that you can observe. So like your eye color, your hair color, your skin color, something that you can see that changes, but it doesn't, um, alter your DNA, your DNA sequence. So according to epigenetics, it suggests that our genes can carry memories of trauma experienced by our ancestors 
and that can influence how we react to trauma and stress. So trauma that's experienced by our earlier ancestors, um, it's in our genes and it makes us more likely to what they call quote unquote switch on um, a negative response when we experience trauma and stress. So if we experience some kind of trauma or stress, um, we turn to negative like coping, like it could be alcohol, drugs. Um, so this is something that's actually in our genes. And interesting, uh, according to the director for Indigenous Health Research at the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute, said that many present day health disparities can be traced back through epigenetics to what is called the colonial health deficit, which is the result of colonization in its aftermath. So, so again, epigenetics beyond me, but it's just interesting to look at it that this is something that's inside us in our genes that we, we have absolutely no control over. And then the other one, um, I had just discussed a little bit earlier, the historical trauma. Um, this historical trauma is really important and it is said to happen in three phases. So you have phase one, the dominant culture, which would be um, the white culture, the Western world. It carries on this mass trauma onto a population. That mass trauma would be colonization or the genocide. Um, and then in phase two, the affected population shows physical and psychological symptoms in response to this trauma. Then phase three, the initial population, meaning our ancestors, uh, they pass these responses to trauma to subsequent generations who then in turn display similar symptoms. So you have genocide happen, colonization happen, then they respond to it psychologically, physically. This is then passed on from ancestors to our generation who in turn display these same symptoms. And then like I had mentioned earlier, it just continues on. Um, the high rates of addiction, suicide, mental illness, and sexual violence can actually be traced back to intergenerational trauma. So the other way that it passes down um, is called the cycle of violence. Again, there's multiple cycles of violence. The one that I'm gonna talk about is the one relating to children. The children, um, according to this cycle of violence, it's a theory that hypothesizes that children who are victimized have a greater chance of being victimized or victimizing others. So in other words, a child that is abused um, has a greater likelihood of continuing to be a victim as they grow up and become an adult, or they can um, become an offender, or they can actually be both. They can continue to be a victim in some aspects, and then they can um, be an offender as they come into adulthood. Um, According to the research, there is um, high amounts of children who are exposed to some type of abuse or violence, whether it be in a home or in the community. And the research has found that this is more likely, child abuse is more likely to happen in certain types of homes, um, poor households, single parent households, households with a lot of stress, and households with some type of marital violence, such as domestic violence. Um, when it comes to our, um, mind you that this is not true, like for all types of household, you know, that have these elements, you know, if this is just according to research, households that have these elements just have a greater likelihood of some kind of violence happening. You know, you. Uh, you know, nothing's guaranteed. You can have a household that has all these elements and everything is fine. It's just saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, according to research that this, these homes with these attributes just have a greater 
likelihood of this happening. And then <clears throat> children who are abused might find it harder to solve these interpersonal problems and they might be more hostile. So a child that has been abu abused or um, seen some kind of violence, they don't know how to solve these problems. And in their image, the only way to solve it then is just to use violence. So, you know, these patterns of behavior can predict more aggressive behaviors. So the more that they are abused or exposed to this violence, the, the more aggressive that they tend to be. You know, so these children who are abused, um, they might not see the world the same that we do. Um, you know, they might see it in more of a negative light and find that violence is the only way to respond to some types of situations. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just gonna give you like a real world example of cycle of violence. So for me, like my mom, she grew up in a household that had an uh, abusive and alcoholic stepfather. He would beat her mom and her younger siblings. And there was times where she would step in because she was just tired of her mom getting beat or her siblings. So now she grows up, she's an adult, she has me. I was, you know, kids are naughty. They don't always listen. So if I did something bad, the way that she would respond would be either physical or she would yell, you know, she would throw things at me, hit me. And it was because the household that she grew up in, this is how things were dealt with. They were dealt with violence. And so she thought that if I was naughty, then this is how you respond. You use violence um, to correct this negative behavior. And it actually wasn't until I had been in therapy and I was talking about my childhood and he's like, you know, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And I was like, it's not. And they're like, no, like you, that's not a normal, you know, quote unquote, normal childhood. Your mom should have responded that way. And it was then that I realized that, yeah, you're right. But it made sense as to why she was the way she was. She was in a household that had this type of violence. She, that's what she understood. That's what she knew. She carried it on when she became a mom. And <clears throat> because now I recognize it, if I were to have children, the cycle would stop with me because I would recognize that, you know, it's not right to respond to negative behavior with violence. So just a little real life example of how that cycle of violence works and how it can pass down, you know, that's three generations, my grandma, my mom, and then me. So then because the cycle of violence um, deals a lot with children, I'm gonna talk, you know, a little bit about child abuse and witnessing violence um, again, this was discussed more in detail with Lenny Hayes' presentation when he talked about the sexual victimization of men and boys. So um, according to the research, the um, children, Native children under the age of 14 are abused at a rate of 1 in 30 compared to 1 in 58 for the general population. Um, Native children are physically abused at a higher rate than <clears throat> white children, but it's found that they might be abused at a rate that is um, similar to or less than that of African American children. Um, one study actually found that 234 Native women, 77% uh, had reported some kind of childhood abuse or neglect in their lifetime. And then it's also not uncommon for the abuse that children experience to be sexual in nature. Um, in the research, they found that the amount of sexual abuse can range anywhere from one to 56% um, of native children that have been sexually uh, abused. 
Um, and then some research suggests that these rates can be much higher. You know, this is what's found in research or what's found in these official reports is what is reported. Therefore, these rates could be so much higher than what we actually know. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons, you know, a child might not disclose being abused. You know, they might not even know that it was wrong. They uh, just, you know, don't understand. Or they could also feel um, embarrassed or ashamed that it happened to them. Um, so even though like we have these numbers of child abuse, um, you know, it's just understood that these numbers are most likely much higher than what we actually know. And then um, witnessing family violence actually has lasting effects on Native children. Um, it's been shown that they can display anxiety, PTSD, low self-esteem, depression, or suicidal thoughts. And then this witnessing or experiencing child abuse, they might seek out unhealthy coping mechanisms such as uh, sex or drinking or drugs. And I realized that I probably went rather fast, more than I should have, but I think that this is a good place to take a break before we kind of shift gears and go into um, changing the stigma of victimization. So we can take like a five, oh, five, 10 minutes. How much time do you think, Ty, for everyone to just kind of regroup and recenter before we come yeah. back? <clears throat> we have used, we've um, usually the five, five minute, um, okay. five minute break is is appropriate unless of course you how do you feel we want to honor your human needs also um i'm just a little thirsty okay <laughs> from talking um so yeah but i just think that what i've covered so far you know it's very dense very very heavy you know talking about all this trauma talking about child abuse uh you know domestic violence sexual assault i think that that was just a lot of information and maybe just take a few minutes to just kind of, you know, clear your mind and uh, then we can come back a little bit refreshed to talk about like not such heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Well, I'll have our tech team play a couple of songs, maybe one full song, and then I'll come back in about five minutes. So it'll be 10 till at that time. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks all. Go ahead and honor your human needs. Take a bio break and we'll see you back in five.
Thank you everybody for taking a moment to honor your own needs um, and to take a bio break. It's important that if you need to step away from any of this content that is emotionally heavy or re-traumatizing, we want to make sure that you uh, feel safe enough that you can step away and, and honor that. Um, we also want to reiterate that for those of you who are participating in the conference, we will be sending slides and recordings and resources to you at the end of the conference, so likely the last week of October, um, keeping in mind that sometimes these editing and rendering pieces take, take a little while, but I promise you, you'll have recordings, you'll have slides, you'll have resources, uh, so that's important because we want you to be able to access this information uh, even after today. So thank you. Go ahead, Sheena. All right, thank you for that. Hopefully everybody, like she said, is recentered as we move on to not so heavy stuff, but very important stuff. All right, so changing the stigma of victimization. There is this stigma that comes when you are labeled victim. So one way to do that is to um, drop the label of victim and carry this label of survivor. Um, you know, it's not always easy to move from victim to survivor. Sometimes it can take, you know, days, weeks, months, even years. Um, but sometimes with this label of victim, there comes this idea of you being weak um, when you become a victim, you have this power that is taken away from you, even for a moment of time. So if someone can go from victim to survivor, that label of survivor gives them the sense of empowerment. It allows them to get that control back. And also you get to control your narrative. Um, another way that we can change the stigma is just have a more open dialogue. Be willing to talk to your children, to your friends, to your family, to neighbors about domestic violence, sexual assault, intimate partner violence. In the past, these were always considered private matters, something that happens within the home. We don't talk about that kind of stuff, but it's important to talk about it because when you talk about it, it can get rid of that stigma. It, and it can also, um, with being a victim, you have this sense of shame or embarrassment, but if you can talk about it, it can take away that shame and embarrassment that comes with being a victim. Um, you know, it helps you to overcome those feelings of being weak or not having this power. Um, you know, it also gives you that ability to, to control your dialogue and control your story. So just be more willing to talk about this um, these uh, uh, types of crimes with others. Um, it's also, you know, important to talk about this stuff because given the statistics that I talked about earlier, um, chances are there's somebody within your community, within your family that has been a victim themselves. And if you can talk about this, you know, it can, uh, give someone a more better understanding of maybe who you are, you know, let them know why you are the way you are, why you do the things that you do. Um, it can also um, create stronger bonds because again, you get a better understanding of who you are or if they're willing to share their story, then you can have that bond of having this shared experience. Um, it can also just create more awareness within your community if you're willing to talk about um, your story and what happened, um, you know, because there is that sense of shame and embarrassment that comes with it. If you're open with your story and someone hears it, maybe it makes them feel less ashamed and embarrassed of what happened. And, you know, now you both can feel empowered and share this story. And it also helps to know like for yourself or for others that, you know, you're not alone. Like you don't have to go through this alone. You know, it happened to me, it happened to you. 
and now we can go through this together we can heal together and also just being more willing to talk about it lets you know that it's okay it is okay that this happened you don't have to blame yourself it's not your fault and it's okay to live your life it's okay to accept what happened let it become a part of you and hopefully it doesn't continue to consume all of you but overall it can just you know give you this this power back and you know start putting your life back together maybe make you start feeling more whole um so these types of crimes domestic violence sexual assault and intimate partner violence in my world in the research world in the criminal justice world we call these gender-based crimes and this because the victim is typically female um, it doesn't mean that the victim is only female. Um, anybody can be a victim of these crimes. Um, you know, male, female, two-spirited, whatever your gender identity, whatever your sexual identity, anybody can be a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, stalking, dating violence, all of those gender-based crimes, anyone can be a victim. And it's also important to know that it can happen at any age. You know, I talked about child abuse. This can happen as a child, an infant. It can happen as an adolescent, a teen, adult. It can even happen as an elder. Um, again, I had read some research that they had done some interviews and found that there was women in their 50s and 60s who had been victims of domestic uh, violence. So again, it can happen to anybody and it can happen at any age throughout your life. Um, and like going kind of a little tangent about the elder abuse, this is starting to um, catch a little bit in research. I know we know that it's an issue in native communities and it has been for a while, but it's now being addressed, you know, just because they're elders doesn't mean that they can't you know, be victims of physical abuse, sexual, you know, abuse, neglect. Um, sometimes there's financial abuse, but um, again, any person, any age, you know, and everyone is important and plays a vital role in our community. So the more that we can share our stories, the more we can create awareness for others, which creates stronger bonds in our community and then we can help protect um, from future victimization. So we go into reducing the risk of victimization. Um, because I'm a researcher, um, a lot of our stuff is theory based. You know, we have theories as to why things happen. Um, and so I'm just going to talk briefly about um, a very well-known theory within my field called routine activities theory. So according to this theory, you need these three elements, a motivated offender, a suitable target, and the absence of a capable, capable guardian. These three elements come together in the same space and time, a crime happens or a victimization happens. Um, Again, the reason I'm talking about this theory is very well tested, it's very well cited. It's also an easier way of explaining how victimization happens. Granted, there's always you know, other factors that are sometimes involved, but this is just a really easy way of trying to understand like how this all comes together, how it happens, and you know, how a crime can take place or victimization. So you might ask, well, what's a motivated offender? Again, this can be anyone, family, friend, neighbor, coworker, it can be a stranger. It's just a motivated offender is anybody that wants to hurt you, bring harm to you. Um, a suitable target or a victim in this case is anybody that um, a person would like to harm. Um, again, a victim can be anybody, male, female, no matter your 
gender identity, sexual identity. It can be any age. Um, so basically anybody can be a potential victim. So the absence of a capable, uh, excuse me, capable guardian. Um, in this case, what a guardian is, it could be a friend, it could be a family, it can be one person, it can be a group of people. It's just basically not you alone. It's having somebody else with you. So now you're probably like, okay, again, why is she telling us this? Um, I just want to point out that it doesn't take much to become a victim. You know, according to this theory, these three elements come together, boom, you have a victimization. So don't blame yourself if it happens. You know, if, if the opportunity presents itself, if these three things come together and you happen to be that suitable target or that victim, you know, just don't blame yourself that if it was going to happen, it's going to happen and chances are there was nothing that you could do to stop it. But having said that, you can still take some steps on reducing your risk of being a victim. Um, you know, be more aware of your surroundings. We're in an age of technology. Everybody's on their phones. Even if you're like out walking, um, you know, you're walking around, you're staring at your phone, texting, Facebook, whatever it be, well, when you're looking at your phone, you're not paying attention to what's going around you. You know, um, is there people around you? Like, what are the buildings? What is the surrounding? So even if you're out on your out walking and you're on your phone, just once in a while, look up, see what's around you. Just be more aware of what's going around um, so that you don't end up in, you know, a situation that can place you at a greater chance of being victimized. You know, be more aware of who you're with. Are you with friends? Are you with family? You know, watch their body language. Are they acting a little bit out of the ordinary? Are they acting kind of shady? Um, you know, and then avoid just dangerous situations. Again, probably something that's easier said than done, but just try not to put yourself in a situation that can increase this chance. You know, don't be out alone at night. Nighttime seems to be like an ideal time that crime tends to happen. And, you know, so if you're going to be out and about at night, try not to be alone. Um, if you're going to go out, you know, to the bar, or to the clubs, you know, have that buddy system, you know, go to the bathroom in pairs, have somebody watch your drink. It's just, you know, having you know, it goes back to that capable guardian, having somebody with you that can watch you, but then in turn, you can watch them. That can help reduce, you know, the chances of you becoming a victim. So we talk about that and now we say, okay, again, who is most, who's the most likely offender of domestic violence, sexual assault, intimate partner violence? You know, is it a stranger? Or is it somebody that you know? Well, according to the research and even just listening to other people's stories, the answer is that it's most likely somebody that you know. It could be a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker. Um, like for my, uh, in my case, it was my best friend's cousin. You know, I knew him. We had um, met a couple times at family gatherings. And then, so it wasn't, you know, the age old saying of, you know, watch out for that stranger to jump out of the bushes and get you. No, you know, for me, it didn't happen that way. And according to the research, and like I said, other stories, the person that's going to hurt you is most likely somebody that you know. Does it mean that it can't be a stranger? Because um, it can, it's just it's less likely that it is gonna be a stranger that hurts you. Again, also know that the offender or the perpetrator can be male, female, um, it can be anybody. Um, I know that uh, a female perpetrator of domestic violence or sexual assault is less common, um, but, but it does happen, you know, um, in regards to male victims, 
again, Lenny had talked about this, but this is, you know, it's less known because it's less reported and there's reasons why it's less reported. You know, there's that stigma again. They think they're not going to be believed. Um, you know, they feel ashamed or embarrassed or they might, you know, in the case of a child, they might not know, but just know that your offender can be male. It can be female. It can be your spouse. It can be your boyfriend, your girlfriend. Um, basically anybody can be the perpetrator. So now we're going to move into tools for a narrative shift. So in my world, in the research world, in the criminal justice world, we're very data driven. We want numbers. Typically what we call it is quantitative data, numbers, numerical data. Why? Numbers are easy to understand. Numbers are easy to analyze. You know, in criminal justice research, um, the things that we do have policy implications. So research that we conduct might show something different or might show something new. And then what happens is we take this information to policyholders and then they can either change a policy or create a policy. And so what we have to do in our world is we need to make it easy for them. And how do you make it easy? Again, numbers, because they want to know, you know, how much, how many, they don't want the details, they don't want the context, they just want simple. However, that's not always the case with native communities. So what can we do? We can educate these stakeholders who work with native communities that getting that numerical data is not always possible. Not every tribe has law enforcement that can collect this data or just in general do, does not have the capacity to collect this data. Some tribes lack funding and resources and they just don't have these capabilities to collect this data. Um, so if we can make other agencies aware of these limitations, then they can shift their perspective of always needing these numbers, this quantitative data, and we can tell them that we have the data, it's just in a different format. We tell them our data is our stories. You know, um, these type of crimes, domestic violence, sexual assault, they typically go unreported. So even if the tribe does have the capacity to capture these numbers, chances are it's not accurate. Therefore, um, if they come to us at, at an individual level, they know that we, as a person, we hold this data and this data is our stories, um, you know, we need to stress to these researchers and criminal justice agency that our, our stories are important. They hold these details. They hold this context of how this happened. Um, you know, we're not just another tally mark like, oh, this month we had four domestic violence and seven intimate partner violences and nine sexual assaults. Like, what we do, what our stories do, is we give a name to these numbers. We give those details, we give that context. And our, our stories are important because historically, we're storytellers. This is how we pass things down from generations to generations. So we, we hold these stories within us. And if those who work in research or in criminal justice can understand that each tribe holds this data. It's just the data is not in the format that they want. And right now there's like the issue of what is the magnitude of violence that's happening in native communities? We can answer that question. Our stories can fill those gaps and let people know how much violence is happening, but they just have to be willing to step out of their little comfort zone of getting numbers and switching gears and would be willing to accept a different type of data. So, you know, we can try and continue to build these bridges 
um, with others, you know, between researchers, law enforcement, victim services, and criminal justice um, agencies and actors. Again, I know there's a lot of distrust in the federal government and other agencies. There's valid reasons, but just understand that researchers and the criminal justice system, they, um, they're what influences policy. And traditionally, Native people, we've been forgotten in policies, we're, we're ignored. Um, but, and then the policies that do exist are rooted in this colonization and these policies actually hurt us. They do more harm, they don't protect us, they don't help us. But if we are willing to um, collaborate and work with these um, other agencies being researchers or criminal justice, then we can get policies that will help us. So right now we have the MMIW and the MMIP movement. This is a collaboration between tribes and law enforcement and how we can collect this data better. So with these movements, um, we can again stress that our, our stories, our data, and that we can answer these questions um, because if more data exists out there, like if these policyholders can get this data, then we they can again, you know, create policies that will protect us and not do continue to do harm to us. Also, you know, we might be able, if we can get more data, we might be able to be eligible for more federal monies that are out there. Um, and then you know, with these movements, we're creating awareness, we're getting our stories out there. So, you know, this, this movement, it's not something new. I mean, how many of you have been asked, oh, is this new? And you know, you try not to roll your eyes and you're like, no, this has been going on for hundreds of years. However, in the general population context, this is just becoming a thing like, five years ago. So, you know, this is something good for us. It's bringing that awareness. You know, we're trying to collaborate and make law enforcement and these um, other agencies understand how a tribe operates and why we have violence, why we have such high rates of victimization. So, you know, just Despite the hesitation and the past, you know, just be more open to researchers that want to understand victimization. You know, most want to help. I've worked with some really good um, professors, you know, at Boise State, even here at University of Nebraska Omaha. They truly care. They truly want to help, you know, and just remember that research influences policies. Um, research can influence police, the, what they do, the way that they practice. Um, it can influence court systems. And, you know, research in general can sometimes spark change. So, again, there's that distrust, there's that hesitation, but just know that, you know, I, you know, myself, however, I'm Indigenous, like, we care, we want to help. And there are people that are not indigenous that are in these research um, fields that do want to help. So the more that we can make our voices heard, the better chances of a change happening. And some ways to do it, what's most relevant right now, we can vote. Yes, easier said than done. Not everybody has the opportunity but if we can vote, we can get people in office that will listen to us, that will create these policies that can help, you know, protect us. And um, again, I understand, you know, voting is not easy for everybody, but if that's one way. Another is pursue higher education. Again, yes, education, super expensive. I have a ton of debt, but um, just know that if you can pursue that higher education, you can get a, a degree that will 
allow you to be in a realm uh, like for me, my PhD allows me to do research, which then I can use to create awareness and inform people and educate them about Native issues. Um, like I said, I know education ex is expensive. It's also not built for everybody. It's built for the Western world. It's built to make us struggle. But, you know, if you are willing to fight the good fight through the education system, you can use your degree to um, create awareness of Native issues. Um, lastly, just, you know, continue, continue telling our stories. Be the voice for those that don't have that voice or feel that they don't have the capacity or the ability to make themselves heard or tell their stories. So we need to continue to tell our stories. You know, let us acknowledge those that are no longer with us or for those that feel like they're alone. You know, tell them that we know you, we hear you, and we see you. So with that, that is actually the end of my presentation. Um, again, I thank you for allowing me to be able to have this discussion with you. It is a great honor and I think it's very important information. And here's my contact information if you have any other questions beyond what is addressed here in the um, presentation. Oh boy, losing my words. <laughs> It's still early in some places. Uh, thank you, thank you so so much, Sheena, for um, walking us through that that presentation. Um, I think it did a good job of connecting several of the pieces of knowledge that we've heard over the last two weeks. In addition to, you know, understanding the the nitty gritty of academia and scholarship and criminal justice lens, even on this work. Um, this is an opportunity since we do have time, but I'm also decolonizing time. We don't necessarily need to fill up two hours if it's if it's uh, it doesn't land that way. So, but that's okay also. But um, several of you had questions that may or may not have been answered in other sessions. Um, Sheena is also available to answer questions about her presentation now. So I invite all of you to use the Q and A feature to submit those. I watch the Q&A feature and I watch the chat. So in either place, feel free to ask a question. I do wanna make a note about some things just as a reflection and not, uh, um, actually it's just a reflection. So especially with regards to the diversity and the way that we do and conduct anti-violence work in Native American communities, right? So there is an opportunity for us to empower young people to be vigilant uh, in self-awareness and to avoid places that may be places they experience harm. Um, but we also have an opportunity to look at what is it what does it mean when we address the immediate needs of the community so that violence doesn't take place? Um, six in one hand, half a dozen in the other, right? Do we uh, encourage self-defense or do we encourage communities that don't that don't use violence? So that's actually a really interesting lens. I'm a sociologist and a political scientist, so while our work is very parallel, it sounds it sounds different between Sheena and I. Um, and uh, that that was actually really interesting as I was as I was listening to you today. Uh, I don't see any questions coming up. Are we sure we don't have any questions, folks? Anything that we want to expand on while you're here? Um, oh, there's a question. The triangle model of a crime. Where did you find that model? Can you was there a citation for that or somewhere that we can all go look? Oh yeah. So it's the theorist that put it together is Cohen and Felsen. I think it's Richard Felsen. I can't remember. If you Google routine activities theory, it should pop up and then you can find uh, information in regards to that theory. Yeah, I can't, yeah. it's cool. I should know this, like my professors would be like, oh my God, how do you not know? It's Cohen and Felsen that was created in 1979. I remember that, but I can't exactly remember both of their first names. <laughs> You know, it's it's really interesting. Like if I think a thing and I know that I read it somewhere else, I have to go back and Google what where I got it. Like I think that the sheer 
like and and your uh, caliber and rigorousness of scholarship now is much more intense than is undergraduate research. So like I can only imagine. Oh. <laughs> I can only imagine. Um, so we have another question. Um, what is the difference between native historical trauma and non-native historical trauma? And there was uh, an anecdote to the question. If in my family history, there is a series of abuse, addiction and rape. My mother was sold to an older man because she was under 21 and had two children and it was frowned upon to be an unwed mother, even though she was a widow. Her mother had been married to a drunk womanizing abuser. My great grandmother was also married to a drunk abuser. I don't know beyond that. How is it different for a Native American versus non? Um, and there's some contextualization about how there is no offense meant by the question. I don't, I think in these spaces, there's no offense taken, but how would you want to approach that question? Um, in regards to the Native victimization, it just dates back to that um, historical context, that idea of colonization and that how that is embedded in our trauma and how that gets passed down. I mean, I don't think there, I mean, there's, I shouldn't say like, I'm, I would think that there's probably historical trauma between, you know, there's the native historical trauma and there's non-native. It's just with the native historical trauma, it just, it's in relation to that colonization and that historical context. So they're probably very quite similar. It's just the manifestation and the roots and origins might be different for natives. Absolutely. And I do, I do want to acknowledge something that violence in indigenous communities is not traditional, right? So just the sheer use of violence, intimate partner violence, domestic violence is a symptom of settler colonialism over the last however many years and generations of settler colonialism. So that is a mm -hmm. sociological truth, full stop. Um, as a result of that, um, and even using some of the MMIW facts and figures, um, I think it's like one in five or one in four women will face, one in five women will face violence from an interracial partner. And of those interracial partners, those 80% of those partners are white. So interracially white, we have white perpetrators, white folks who are using violence against indigenous women. So we have to look at the intergenerational trauma and the use of violence at the intersections of oppression and the intersections of racism and how that passes down intergenerationally. Interracial marriages between indigenous women and white men didn't happen until more recently because prior to that, during westward expansion, that was rape and trafficking, not relationships. So that, that level of intergenerational trauma is also so deeply embedded in our community without access to healing or community accountability until now. So I think that this tapestry of uh, sociology and criminal justice and psychology and uh, social norms. So like all of those things are just woven together in the way that we address this issue in indigenous communities. So I hope that helps. And there's another piece to that too. All of the resources built to address violence in um, Western white communities are built based on Western white values, morals, and cultural understanding. So those systems don't incorporate the way that we heal and address trauma in indigenous communities. So that also plays a big piece in the difference of addressing intergenerational and historical trauma. So I hope that gives you a little bit different of a lens. Like, again, that's coming from me as a sociologist, not necessarily as somebody who understands criminal justice, but there, there is a discussion of both of those things in, in, in our disciplines. Um, let's see. So we're getting some questions now. Um, <laughs> with the with changing the stigma of victim, what are your thoughts on victims and survivors referring to the journey from victor to victim to survivor, and those who find strength in the mourning and grief part of a victim's journey? That's an hmm. interesting question. Do you want me to read that out again? <clears throat> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Okay, without changing or with 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 changing the stigma of victim, what are your thoughts on victims and survivors referring to their victim to survivor journey, and what are your thoughts on those who find strength in the mourning and grief part of a victim's journey? That's a multi-layered question for sure. Yeah, I mean, 
everybody's journey is different. Um, I do think it is important to mourn and grieve. Um, that is part of the healing process. Um, you know, some people don't have those aspects, you know, maybe they're just, they can immediately go from that victim to survivor status. Um, it's just hard because everybody's journey is different. Um, I didn't acknowledge mine for what, 13 years. And then I realized like, okay, you know, I'm a survivor. So, I mean, it, everybody's is different. Um, I did not mourn, I didn't grieve, but I think it was just cause I didn't understand what happened and I just kept living my life. But, you know, I do think that mourning and grieving is important and it's just in general, everybody's journey is different. There's no road map to get to that, um, you know, status of survivors. Some people live their whole lives in the status of victims. You know, it's just, you need to do, I guess, what's best for you. You know, what works for one person doesn't always work for the other person. So it's a very individualized experience. Not saying that you can't go through it with somebody. Um, maybe someone has something that's similar, like your experiences are similar um, and you can lean on them, but just to know that your experience is your own. Absolutely. And I think um, I, even at the coalition, we have, um, we take the approach, uh, a people centered approach, right? So people impacted by violence, folks impact, families impacted by violence, so that it's the people, the person that's centered in that conversation. And, and it does get complicated, right? We don't ever want to take away somebody's experience by wordsmithing the, how they identify. Uh, so I, but that is a very complicated question, indeed. I, I use both, like I am a woman impacted by violence and I also use the term survivor as well. Uh, and I think that it, it's possible to hold both truths. Victimization, you're right, that's a, that's a, that's a shift um, in language and in understanding. And um, at the coalition, and I think even in my work, I try to champion a strength-based approach, right? So victimization is in fact from a deficit model rather than strength-based approach. So em empowering, women impacted by violence, two-spirit relatives impacted by violence. Um, like we don't say battered women anymore, like that that doesn't center the experience of the woman. So I can see how that's complicated for us, but I would, my, I'm finding that best practice is to always center the humanity of a person and even just respect and honor the way that they identify themselves and their own experience. So I appreciate that question for sure. And thank you, Sheena, for that reply. Um, we have another uh, another question. I find the ultimate solution of systemic appeal, and if people only knew, and I quote, if people only knew they would change, unquote, to be difficult to believe in, are there other paths to stopping these types of longstanding violence that you want to share about? So what are potential solutions that are outside of what we understand in the system? Ooh. Yeah. That's, a, that's a big all, all of the world's problems she knows right i'm now. like all right and go <laughs> um wow uh what are some solutions i mean yeah that's uh that's a big you know in my area criminal justice you know they they try to produce like laws but you know there's a difference between writing a law and enacting it and then implementing it um, you know, I think definitely a native, um, aspect community is like, you know, where it's at, lean on your community, reach out to those, um, because again, as mentioned, you know, the Western world isn't compatible with ours, but yeah, I don't know. That's a big question. I don't know. I feel like I didn't answer it and I feel bad. <laughs> no, no, no. That was actually, I, I, that's a very difficult question to answer. And I, I, I'll i probably be mulling over it for a little while too. I mean, but it takes a, it takes a bit for us to, to have 
walk these journeys or journey with academia and all our academic accolades, which is exactly the system, and try to reimagine a world where our accolades aren't important, right? But then the whole community is thriving. I think that you're right. A combination, like our work is a, an amalgamation of everything that we're trying to do, it, uh, assert that story data has much more value than quantitative data, um, change the way that we approach uh, addressing violence. What does policymaking look like as a result of cultural understanding and responsiveness? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's, it's a combination of both. I don't, um, <laughs> outside of this particular role, and I'll soften this a little bit, I am a, a much more radical and revolutionary about the way that we approach this work, but I understand that we have to sort of navigate these containers to, to do what we can while at the same time working towards doing more and revolutionizing. So that's a, that's a difficult, a difficult uh, walk for, for us. And you're, you're right about the policy piece. Like that's, that is exactly the container. That is exactly, you know, the thing that we have to try to work through and around to do the work that we're doing. So I appreciate you trying at that question. That was definitely a heavy question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, on the issues with victimization data, uh, one, of, one of the issues with victimization data is classification of crime and race or identity. As a researcher, what can we do to help work on this issue? Um, yeah, definitely, like, we always, like, natives, we always get lumped into the good old other category, and a lot of times, um, even I find myself sometimes when I conduct research, when you're trying to break down that race, ethnicity, you know, item, you're like, okay, yeah, you have an abundance of white African American, and then you maybe have like three or four um, native, and you're like, well, that's not enough in the research standpoint, it's not enough to have stand on its own. So then, yeah, you lump it in. I mean, I'll, I guess all you can do is, you know, stress to those that are conducting, you know, collecting this data that it is important to continue to break apart these race ethnicities. I know like sometimes it'll be like two or more races, you know, and maybe in there it's like somebody like I'm half white, half native. So, you know, maybe that person who's like me chooses to answer two or more races instead of like I identify strictly as native. Um, so I just, I guess it can sometimes come down to like a, a personal thing, but we need to like stress this to those who are collecting this large data. Like we have all these like national surveys. I know the, um, the National Crime Victimization Survey actually does a pretty good job of uh, collecting the data that categorizes Native Americans. Um, but you know, then you have like these smaller level data collection that don't quite, I mean, I guess all we can do is just keep pushing out there that it counts to separate these race ethnicities, you know, and then sometimes, yeah, with the crime type, um, it might get lumped all together. Domestic violence tends to be the big umbrella term. You know, if you're a victim of sexual assault, rape, uh, intimate partner violence, sometimes it just categorizes under domestic violence. So then again, it's just important to stress that we need to differentiate between those two because the perpetration of those crimes are different. The victimization of those crimes are different. So, I mean, for me, all I can do is, you know, continue to fight the good fight and, you know, stress to those who do collect this data with myself being included that, you know, this is important. This is how we can fill that gap of, you know, the magnitude of the violence that's happening in our communities is that if you don't differentiate our race and our ethnicity from the other category, you're not going to be able to answer those questions. Yeah, absolutely. It is a, and I, I have this conversation with my sister Melanie quite a bit, like what does it mean to identify the way we identify in a space that's like 
that is doing research on our, our own people, right? Are we doing research on our people or with our people, right? So that kind of becomes the like hypothetical question, like the, the philosophical question, research for our people or with our people. I also think it's interesting um, that racial identification within research and statistics is uh, a um, closed question, right? So rather yeah. than asking, how do you identify? It's which of these, check these boxes, right? Yeah. Versus like, what would happen to the research? How much more dynamic and nuanced would it be if that was an open, how do you, how do you racially identify? And then what shows up? And even, I mean, that my sociology brain loves that. So <laughs> like, how do, how do people identify themselves? And, um, and even this idea within indigenous communities, do people identify as Native American for their ancestry because 23andMe told them so, or do they identify as Native American because they have a storied connection to their community and it's their way of being and their way of le living. So that, that also kind of opens it up even further. So yeah, we've got a lot of work to do in the way that we yeah. navigate research. We, and I, by that, I mean you and Melanie, because I'm not in that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's y'all's thing. <laughs> we actually, yeah, we had this discussion in class the other day. It was uh, we had to create a survey, and you get to the good old demographic questions. You know, what is the appropriate way to ask? You know, another big one is gender. You know, how do you appropriate ask that? And I think it's becoming to be more towards an open ended. Mm -hmm. You know, because you don't you don't want to put somebody in a box. You don't want to categorize them. You know, you need to tell us how you identify, and you know, recognizing that that's becoming an issue. And the same thing with race, ethnicity. All it is is just simply, like you said, going from a closed-ended question to an open-ended. Add a line. Let you write what you need to write, and let it be us, the researcher, our job then to uh, clear up. You know, or try to make categories from what you have written, not so much what we have given you to choose from. Yeah. And there lies the implicit bias to statistics, right? Like not even realizing the adverse effect that choosing categories for people versus folks opting into their own self-identification could cause. So that's, um, and Melanie screams in the chat box that this is all disaggregated data. So yay. <laughs> I think <laughs> She was trying to get it. <laughs> uh, there's another question here. Uh, it would be great to have the public access data for their community fundraising and awareness. However, some leaders prohibit sharing. Take it as using using it, taking it as using against a tribe. Maybe personalizing it. They stress data sovereignty, but it is uh, censorship or prohibited access. How do we allow access and not hoard? So I'm going to make some. Um, assumptions on that question is, so what it sounds like is, how do we allow ethical access to this data without it being um, bastardized, stolen, and or personalized for capital gain, which essentially defines all of anthropology up until 1975? I'm sorry. Oh my God, I zoned out. I, yeah, no, that's okay. I'm terrible. Oh, you say that <laughs> no, that's okay. How do we how do we allow ethical access to this data? Um, for the, like for the safety of the community. Uh, what I'm what I'm hearing is is that this data you all have, or that some of these surveys that are out there can be used uh, for public awareness and fundraising. But there are some there are some tribal leaders, some organizations. Uh, within tribes that disallow that data to be used publicly. So what, what do you think might be a solution or a, a problem piece? Um, well, I think this a lot stems back to like, you know, that, that history of using that data against us, you know, weaponize that data, you know, make it sound like we're just, you know, a bunch of crazy savages living on this land, creating all this violence and victimization. I think it's just creating this awareness to, you know, to those, uh, the tribe, you know, those that are in charge, you know, the elders, the the business council, whoever it be that holds this data that it's okay to like release this, but, you know, um, make sure that the person that wants access to this data is willing to work 
with you? Like you said, you know, are we working with our people or um, just, you know, talking about, so like when I approached my data or my, my uh, thesis was, I said, you know, here's my idea, but what can I do for you? And, you know, just have that transparency to know that we can use this data in good ways. Yes, we can use it in bad ways, but, you know, you, you know, depending on the researcher, you know, most that are coming into communities, I mean, you hope, you hope that they're wanting to do good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and a lot of this data that's out there, you know, some of it is public, but then here you go, you run into that issue that Melanie brought up is it's not disaggregated. You know, we can't even use it in our communities because, um, you know, we're categorized as other, so we can't even use like national, you know, public data. So we have to rely on these smaller uh, units of data. But I think it's just, comes down to just like educate, you know, make, make others aware that, you know, in the past this data was weaponized, but that's not the same, you know, today in all, you know, situations. Yeah, no, that's fair. And I, um, Melanie, for those of you who are didn't didn't catch it in the last couple of days, Melanie Fillmore is in her PhD program at Boise State University and is also was also the researcher on the Idaho Thriving Grant, Thriving Families Grant at the Idaho Coalition that was being conducted over the last year. And so that ultimately evolved into a um, research project. Uh, regarding missing and murdered Indigenous people that she's taken on as part of her PhD experience. And the way that she's going about it, for those of you who are new to academia, um, is, also, is like extending invitations to presentations uh, and research plan presentations to the community. So those of us who have worked in partnership with her, there's always a constant report back, like this is what I'm doing and this is how I'm doing it and this is who I've talked to. And that constant feedback loop is super important because that models indigenous communities rather than an academic model where she could really just truck along and we never hear from her again in, for three years, right? So like that, that is actually a really, um, I think that she may or may not be a maverick behind that, that process, uh, but that I think it feels good that I always can speak to what she's doing to some degree and that she's accessible and that um, once the data process starts in this project, we'll all be made aware, we'll all be able to guide her and how that data is being used. Of course, we're not going to be privy to it because it's data and there's an IRB process, but at least we know and are comfortable with the fact that she's serving the community versus doing research about us. Like Indigenous communities are not lab rats, right? Like we are not, right. you know, uh, guinea pigs, like we really are humans with unique experiences and a unique history in the United States. And I think that Melanie's experience as an indigenous researcher affords her access and um, cultural knowledge and understanding that helps her navigate the space well. So if those of you are in touch with researchers, please use that as a practice. Um, if yeah. you have research to do within indigenous communities, also use that as a practice. And kind of a sidebar, um, but kind of related, the Shoshone Paiute Nation, I think, just reported that 100% of their people uh, participated in the census. And so whatever that success model was is exactly how folks should be doing research in our communities. And I think that it was because they used community to navigate and have these conversations in community. And that is like a thousand times important, more important than just getting data. Uh, making it accessible, yeah. making it community focused and community oriented. And that can look a couple of different ways. I always say it, show up with food, you know, uh, but I'm really proud to see that. I mean, I have my apprehensions about government systems and processes like the census. However, it was exciting to see that the show Shoshone Paiute people, all eligible folks participated. So that's so great. Yeah. Um, I think that that was it for our questions. Just, were there any other thoughts that you had in some of these questions? Maybe something that you, you wanted to add? Um, just, you know, I mirror, you know, how Melanie's approach, like I said, I, with the community I worked with, I came in, you know, here's my idea, but then I paused and was like, but what can I do for you? Is this something that you need? Is this something that's going to benefit you? And when I actually wrote out my thesis, I have a little section that kind of 
basically like walks a non-native person through how to correctly conduct research in a native community. You know, I talk about the historical context. I talk about like the past history of how, you know, data was used against us. So when you come into a community, you need to come in with the mindset of what can I do to help you? Like, what do you need? Yes, I have my own, you know, ideas, but it might not be compatible with what is something that's more important that needs to be addressed in that community. You know, I stress, you know, the transparency. You know, I met several times with the, the business council, be like, this is what we're doing. Like, I showed them my survey before I sent it out to make sure that it wasn't going to, you know, be offensive or, you know, that it would be understandable. You know, they had some questions, some feedback. But yeah, like you said, that continuous co um, communication is very important so that they always, you know, feel, we feel included in this research. We don't feel like we're just a part of it or uh, that we're just like a subject of it, that we're actually involved. And, you know, we, that's like extremely important. And yeah, so it definitely mirror Melanie's approach because I think that in specifically in our communities, it's very important to have a different approach than if you were just to go into another, you know, community. Um, you know, I think this approach should be used for like all minority communities for sure, because every community has their own history, has their own reasons for distrust of researchers and, you know, government agencies. So definitely always go in with, you know, an open mind and, you know, basically say, what, what, what can I do for you? You know, how can, how can this benefit you? Not how can it benefit me? How can it benefit you as a community? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I like that. Serving the stated needs of the community. We can't stress that enough. That was guidance from EJ Yoma Luyo, like during her Collective Thriving conference presentation. So serving the stated needs of the community. That should always be a, a question, a, a point of reflection at, at several points during any research project, during any you know, survey, during any um, engagement, are we serving the stated needs of the community? Because those needs could also change at any given time. Sure, yeah. Yeah, um, I think that I think that we are we are at a good place to kind of conclude. Um, I did just want to uh, again offer deep gratitude for you, Sheena, for um, joining us and for being a part of this conversation and offering the historical lens and you know how we need to shift the narrative about interacting with families impacted by violence. I want to remind folks that. Um, we are sending out surveys every week. So please, please check your email. This, this conference is the first of its kind out of the coalition. And so having your feedback and insight on how best we can give you a meaningful experience is really important to us. So please, please submit those uh, surveys as you see them come through your inbox. Um, I think that Sheena's presentation today really lended itself as an excellent segue into next week. Um, so did, um, so did Nicole's yesterday. So we've got some very practical skills learning next week from NAMIS training, which is the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. So that's how missing people are uh, found and communicated on a national level. So there's training on how to use that database, where it can be integrated in indigenous communities. And then of course, Amber Alert training on Wednesday, Amber Alert in Indian country. So there's actually a very specific department for Amber Alerts for indigenous communities that I knew nothing about until I started planning this conference. So uh, we've got that on day two. Day three of next week, this is where I need um, community participation. And I mentioned this yesterday, I'll probably mention it every day uh, until next week. But we have um, a law enforcement panel coming in to speak and spend some time with us. And during that panel, I would like to position questions to them that have come from community, from survivors, from survivor families, um, because I think that those are the voices that need to be amplified most in a panel discussion. 
as of right now, the questions that are coming in have to do with process, have to do with lines of communication or lack thereof. Um, some of them have to do with um, bureaucracy and accessibility of these processes when a relative goes missing. So if you know somebody, please share this link, the Survey Monkey, um, so that we can gather all of these questions, we'll curate them, and then I will moderate the panel next week. As of right now, we have a representative from the FBI, representative from the City of Boise Police Department, a representative from the Idaho State Police, and then we have some tentative, yes, tentative yeses from our tribal law enforcement of the three tribes that I've worked with this year. So please, please share that. Please keep an eye out for the evaluations. Um, Please get rest and uh, take care of yourselves. You know that this work is heavy and that these presentations are information heavy as well. And we wanna make sure that we're honoring and centering your human needs uh, in the aftermath of these spaces. Please let us know if you need anything. Uh, visit www.engagingvoices.org if you need to get a hold of any of us or find more information mm -hmm. about next week's sessions. Um, but I think that covers it, Sheena. Again, thank you for being here. Thanks to our ASL and translation and closed captioning team. I appreciate your support during this conference as well. You all have a nice day and a good evening, and we will see you on Tuesday. Hamakis Klatsia, Yo Kalo.